Parliament convened on Friday. A speaker and deputy speaker were elected and a new president voted for. Nothing particularly out of the ordinary in our 30 years of democracy, except it all took place amid last-minute court applications, threats of boycotting and ongoing negotiations on a government of national unity. Yeah, just minutes before the first sitting of our seventh democratic administration, many parties were still in tense negotiations, both internally and with others. A broad agreement was signed between the ANC and Democratic Alliance, but details remain scant. Joining us now for a perspective from inside those talks is the chairperson of the DA's Federal Council and a key member of its negotiating team, Helen Ziller. Helen, thank you so much for joining us tonight in studio. It's such a pleasure, Marcia. I just can't imagine what those talks must have been like. On Friday, it all came down to the wire. It must have been very, very, very intense on those negotiations as well. What do you think is the biggest contribution the Democratic Alliance can bring to this new government structure? Well, first of all, the kind of determination we showed in those last hours when we were getting the final documents signed and sealed. You know, we don't give up, and the negotiations with the ANC stopped at about 2 o'clock that, that morning, and they decided to elevate it then to the president and John Steers, and Hazen, our leader, to finalise. At 3 o'clock, I went to bed. At 5 o'clock, John contacted the uh, president... At 10 past 6, I had a version, version 10, and I thought, this is great. Version 10? Version 10, and I thought, this is great. Between 10 past 6 that morning and when we started voting, we went through seven more versions. In fact, version 10 was great at quarter past 6 that morning. I checked it very carefully. All our stuff was in there. The wording was well. 10 to 8 that morning, I get version 14. I don't know what's happened to 11, 12 or 13. I don't know what the differences are. I'm having to rush to the convention centre. Big mistake, I leave my laptop at home. I take my broken cell phone because I fell in the election campaign and broke my cell phone. And I had to do the last three or four versions on a cracked cell phone from the floor of the parliament in session. Helen, tell us, what, what were the changes in that last version? Was it about how ministers get decided? No, no. no the, 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 you know, the DA is not about positions. We're not about haggling about positions. Obviously, we would like positions in which we can implement our manifesto prom promises, and we would like to make a difference to people on the ground. But those are the last things we discuss. The DA starts with principles, values, program of government, and then we crucially look at the modalities and mechanisms of decision-making. Because in a coalition or a government of national unity, that's really important, because things break up over that. And so the critical things that had been changed from 10 past 6 that morning to 10 to 8 that morning were the critical clauses on proportional representation and sufficient consensus, clause 16 and clause 19. And somehow there must have been three iterations where the ANC must have been going backwards and forwards, and the draft 14 had the president's changes in it, and we couldn't go with Clause 16 and Clause 19. So when I arrived at the convention centre, I was lucky to be out of my pyjamas then, I promise you. When I arrived there, I knew we didn't have an agreement. And I contacted our team and I said, we don't have an agreement we can sign. We don't. And it went on and backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, and eventually at about 11.35, I get a version that I say we can sign. And, and, and we've already had a look at the final version, which, mm. which we obviously know how it ends. But this is a statement of intent, right? Is this a legally binding document? Because it feels like the agreement could fall apart and a party could walk away without any consequences. Should there be a bill which compels parties to stick in the coalition? Well, first of all, parties can walk away, clearly, but then there's a price to pay. Because we went through this process, we've got a signed document, we're making it public. That is a big defence to make the document public because then the public will know who is violating the agreement. So that's very helpful. And yes, we do believe there should be laws to govern coalitions. We believe in thresholds. We believe that uh, coalition agreements must be binding. We believe in a number of things. There shouldn't be 
all, all that many votes of no confidence in a single term. There's got to be a reason to have a vote of no confidence. All of these things to stabilise the coalitions. And that's why we've got legislation before Parliament right now. And you say, Helen, you know, the DA is not talking about positions at this point in time. It was on Friday at the CTICC, the DA leader, John Steenhazen, in that media scrum. He did say that, look, we didn't talk about positions, but what we can say is that DA leaders will be across the board from the executive to portfolio committees Correct. and decision-making rooms. Was yes. that the strategy? And also, are there any key ministries that you would say that you are looking at or eyeing? Well, we could fix a lot of them. Some will take much longer, and people mustn't have inflated expectations. They mustn't think, OK, the DA gets a portfolio today, and <clears throat> six months down the line, the problem will be solved. It won't be. It's taken 30 years to break a lot of things, and it's not going to be fixed in three years. We are going to have to get going. We've got to get the right people in the right positions. We've got to get budget allocated to critical things that we need in our governance plan. We need to implement them without any corruption and with good management and with good performance management, and then we will get outcomes. But it is a process. The Western Cape looks like it does because the DA has been in power there for 15 years. That's how long it takes. How are you going to navigate that terrain when it comes to opposing and contradicting policies, foreign policy, when it comes to BEE, when it comes to the NHI bill, which the DA is vehemently against and the ANC is totally for as well? How are you going to navigate those things? Well, I'm not sure the ANC is totally for some of those things that cost them so many votes and they'll have to kind of rethink. One of them was the NHI that cost them so many votes. So they'll have to rethink a lot of things. But that's why Clause 19 and the agreement is so important. It defines sufficient consensus as being reached when parties that constitute 60% of the government of national unity can reach agreement. Now, that is critical because it means that the DA will never be in a position where it's merely propping up an ANC government. But you're holding them together. Without the DA, the ANC possibly couldn't get enough votes in Parliament to get their decisions through. Well, what is the choice? The big question in politics, Govan, is always compared to what? Compared to the DA, well, it's not a great... Uh, the best option for South Africa would have been if the DA won an overall majority. That would have been happy days for South Africa. But we didn't. So what are the options? And we said we want the least bad option. Now... So this would, government is the least bad option? Of all the options on the table, yes. Because let me put it to you. The other alternative is having the ANC, EFF and MK. That would be the worst of all possible but options. But now the DA Africa. finds itself in a position where it's going into cabinet, possibly, and the president has the prerogative to appoint ministers from the ANC side. We saw the likes of Gwede Mantashe, who's been implicated in the state capture report, being sworn in. Malusi Gigaba was also sworn in. He may not get a cabinet position. But will you accept having to share a cabinet now with people implicated in the state capture report. We'll certainly accept the justice portfolio if we can get it, because then we can do something about the state capture report. You see, the important thing to realise is that we were very strategically careful that we would never be caught in a situation where we were merely there propping up an ANC government. We had to have me meaningful power. And the backwards and forwards in the final hours through those last uh, seven drafts was precisely to ensure that we had something meaningful on the table, that we could achieve something meaningful with what we had on the table, and that we were not just a kind of crutch to the ANC. Then what do you say to DA voters who may feel a little bit betrayed? Because in your campaign, your campaign to rescue South Africa, mm. rescue South Africa, particularly from the ANC government, but here you are in bed with them. And you're saying, look, what is the other option? But the other op option is governing from the opposition benches again. Well, you don't govern from the opposition or benches. That's the problem. Role there. You can't make things happen from the opposition benches. And the truth is that our biggest election promise to the voters is that we would keep out what we then called the doomsday coalition, the anti-constitutionalists. We said, we promise you we will keep out the people who are set on destroying our constitution. Jacob Zuma campaigned against the constitution. He wanted to get rid of the power of judges and all of that sort of thing. Julius Malema was also campaigning against the Constitution. So we said to our voters, we will keep out the Doomsday Coalition, ANC, EFF, MK. Hello, and it's it, very significant that the ANC sent their brightest and their best, a really excellent negotiating team, to negotiate with us. And we all had South Africa's interests up front, and we actually got on very well, and we could speak about how we create 
the South Africa envisaged in 1994 under the Constitution. But it does appear that this coalition rests on Cyril Ramaphosa being president of the ANC. So what would it take for the DA to walk away from this agreement? Well, if people violated the statement of intent and its terms, we would walk away. If the president wanted to hire and fire DA ministers without going through the proper process of doing that in consultation with our leader, John Stianhausen, we would walk away. And if Paul Mashatile replaces Cyril Ramaphosa as ANC president? He has to stick to the agreement too. Does the agreement then say that no presidency for a Paul Mashatile? No, of course it doesn't. We can't pick the ANC's yeah. people. They can't pick our people. That is in the agreement. But if the president is there, we are not out of opposition. We're in a government of national unity, but we will take strong positions against the issues that we don't like. And I'm sure all the other parties in the government of national unity will as well. We're still the DA. We still stand up for things very fiercely, very strongly to defend the constitution, non-racialism, the rule of law, a market-based economy. We're there doing all of that and trying to make things work for South Africa. The best possible option we could get now, in other words, the least bad option we could get now, is to go into government with the ANC, even though that is something that we wouldn't have even been able to countenance a year ago. But the truth is that when we look at what's in South Africa's interest, with the result that we got, ANC on 40%, the DA just over 20%, and a range of tiny little parties, and MK, a very strong and menacing presence, and the EFF, the most stabilizing force in the center of our country, is the government of national unity that we're setting up now. And that, out of the results that we got, is in the best interest of South Africa. Helen, thank you so much for coming all the way into studio and joining us tonight and taking us into the preview of those talks. Thank you, Masa. Thanks for watching. Why not drop us a comment below? We love reading your opinions. Remember, you can now access carte blanche stories anytime, anywhere, even offline. Carte Blanche, the podcast, is now available on all major podcast platforms. So be sure to hit that follow or subscribe button and be part of our growing online family.